All right, so Shabbat Shalom again, and uh, welcome to everyone to our afternoon study. Obviously, you guys know we've been journeying through Torah. You know, I was looking back of our journey and where we come through and started in the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, moved to the book of Exodus, where we saw salvation and redemption. Leviticus, we looked at holiness and worship, how to be one with Yah. And now in Numbers, um, we looked at the, the names and the meaning of the names and numbers coming from numeri in the Latin, meaning the numbering, the numbering of the children of Israel or Midbar in the Hebrew um, literally means in the wilderness. Uh, numbering also coming from the Greek arithmi, which means arithmetic, which is where we get numbering, counting from. And we see, you know, as we journey through, we saw the numbering of all the tribes. Um, we saw the numbering of the Levitical family. We saw the setup of the camp. We saw the building of the tabernacle and, and it being raised up. Um, then we saw the moving of the camp together. The trumpet blast, it set all the movement. Um, and we walked through understanding the differences in the movements of the different tribes and why they moved the way they moved surrounding the tabernacle. Um, and then we saw last week um, and the week prior, we saw murmuring seep into the camp from those that were uh, coming along with the Israelites. And then we saw the, the leadership, Miriam <laughs> and, uh, and uh, Aaron murmuring, complaining. And we saw how all of that seeps in even now as we relate everything that we've been going through to our lives. This is the book of warfare. This is where we see those things um, that were used as tests and trials um, for, for, the, for the furnishing and the strengthening of their faith. And we know that we have those same uh, trials um, here. Uh, we're, we're, we're gonna see how they literally did go to war, um, but they only moved when Yahuwah told them to move. And as they were obedient, they were able to get the victory every time they were obedient. So this is the beginning of that journey. This is the beginning of their, their movement into K Kedesh Barnea, um, the holy place of wandering where they are um, and the journey <clears throat> that was an 11 day journey as we read in Deuteronomy last week or two weeks ago, 11 day journey took them 40 years uh, because of the disobedience and, and lack of faith. So um, how long are we stuck in what Yahuwah is doing in our lives because we refuse to be obedient? because we refuse to listen, because we refuse to have the faith that it takes to do the things that he calls us to do. How long are we stuck in the mud, running on a treadmill, running in circles, because we can't graduate to that point where he needs us to be? Warfare is a part of that. We'll see that, excuse me, we'll see that as we continue to read through. Um, here in chapter 13, um, some interesting things occur and we're gonna read through, um, but there's something specific that we wanna talk about in regards to names. Um, and I think it's uh, important that we look at them in, in the light of, you know, discrepancy, in light of bad translation, in light of what names mean. So we have to make sure that we're doing that in the midst of watching how these names mean something in regard to who these people were um, and where Yahuwah has placed them in this journey. Um, so here we're gonna learn about the spies um, sent to be forward observers, to, to look into the land that Yahuwah has given them. Um, and it matches the, 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 the testimony of the prophecy 
that he gave to Abraham. We're going to look at that as well. He didn't promise them a virgin land. He didn't promise them land that was untouched. He told them that he was going to remove something, remove someone from the land that he was going to give them. So we'll, uh, we'll pick up the reading um, in chapter 13, um, starting in verse 1. Let's look at... Uh, Let's read, let's read the first 16 verses, um, and then we'll go back through and, and, and speak through uh, what it's telling us. The first 16 verses, so who would like to read first? Um, Numbers chapter 13, we're going to read verse 1 uh, through verse 16. Go ahead, Stefan. Shalom. All right. Um, <clears throat> and Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, send you men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Yahshua, of every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man, everyone a ruler among them. And Moshe, by the commandment of Yahuwah, sent them from the wilderness to Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Yahshua. <clears throat> And these were their names of the tribe of Reuben, Shemu Shemua, the son of Zakur, of the tribe of Shimeon, Shaphat, the son of Choria, Shori, of the tribe of Yehuda, Caleb, the son of Yahu, uh, Yapona, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, of the tribe of Yishkar, Yagal, the son of Yosef, of the tribe of Ephraim, Husha, the son of Nun, of the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Rafu, of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Cody, of the tribe of Yosef, namely, of the tribe of Manasseh, gladly the son, Gadi, the son of uh, Kusi, of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gama Gamali, to what verse, brother? Did you want me to stop? 16? Yeah, read through 16. Stop. 16? Stop at 17. Okay. Of the tribe of Asher, uh, Seir, the son of Mikael, of the tribe of Natali, Nab uh, Nabi, the son of Vopsi, of the tribe of God, Gil, the son of Niki, these are the names of the men which Moshe sent to spy out the land. And Moshe called Husha the son of Nun, Yahusha. Praise Yah, praise Yah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> interesting translation there. So uh, what, um, what stands out to you versus? <clears throat> um... There's a few things I'm just trying to figure out which to point out. Um, so you there, bro? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Uh can I get that screen again? Thank you, brother. Uh <clears throat> Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure what to point out at this moment. Other, can you come back to me? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes when we're reading, it's uh, difficult to, uh, you know, see something. Um, so that's fine. Definitely read back through and see, see what um, yeah is showing you. So we have this situation here. Um, 
where there is this idea um, to go out and send ahead of them men um, that would give them a view, I call it forward observers. Um, I, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was with an artillery unit. Um, I was a communication specialist, but I was with an artillery unit um, at one particular time. And when we went out on um, missions, ops, we had to be the forward observers for the area that we were going to, um, for lack of a better word, attack. Um, so what we would do is go out and survey the land. We would send the coordinates back. We would let them know where the key elements were, um, where the, the howitzers, which were the artillery, where they would shoot, right? And it was very important that we, we knew exactly what it looked like. <laughs> it can, we could spell out exactly the picture for the artillery unit um, to attack so that we had to know where everything was logistically and that we can see um, the vital points to attack the enemy to eliminate them. So um, very important um, as they are preparing to go to war to have forward observance of, of not only the land and its logistics, but where their enemies was, were placed. Um, so very important that we see this. But one of the things that, 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 I, that I saw here is that um, Moses um, is hearing from Yah and Yah is giving them direction um, for what to do. But I read in Deuteronomy and I and it got a bigger picture that this was actually the people's idea that they brought to Moshe that Yahuwah liked and Moshe liked and they gave them direction on what to do. So in Deuteronomy chapter 21, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter one, somebody turn to Deuteronomy chapter one and read verses 21 through 23. Deuteronomy chapter one, verse 21 to 23. Go ahead, Sister Sheen. See, Yahuwah your Elohim has put the land before you. Go up and possess it, as Yahuwah Elohim of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear nor be discouraged. And all of you came near to me and said, let us send men before us and let them search out the land for us and bring back word to us of the way by which we should go up and of the cities into which we would come. And the matter was good in my eyes. So I took 12 of your men, one from each tribe. Praise Yah. So we see on behalf of the people, Yahuwah set this plan up. And it just showed me how... <laughs> Yahuwah doesn't move until he hears from us. We talk about trumpets and our voices being the trumpet and the victory coming when the voices of the people sound together. We see how even counsel and prayer that Yahuwah's ears are bent toward us, waiting for us. He says, call on me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things you know not of. On behalf of the people with this great idea that matched Yahuwah's will, right? He granted it and told them and gave them direction on how to do it. So I just wanted to point that out because as we go forth and understanding that this is not only warfare for the Israelites here, this is, this is for our learning for our warfare here in 2021. We can't fight with what we, with the way we know how to fight, you know? Um, we have to fight the way Yahuwah wants us to fight. And we can only do that if we're tied in with him, if we're communicating with him, if we're supping with him, if we're meditating on his word, if we're understanding it, getting direction from him in everything that we do. And this is what the Israelites are going to have to learn. You know, this is what the Israelites are learning. Um, and some are disobeying, you know. 
Um, and we're gonna see that all the way through. So I wanted to point that out um, before we get started with the names, but um, did anyone else wanna add anything? Uh, Brother Rick, Dadio, Stefan, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I find this very interesting that we see that this is telling us that these are the these are the heads of, of Yisrael. These are the leaders of every tribe. You know, these are the tribe of Yisrael. The, these are the lead. I and mean, think about that. These are the these these are the the the, the you know the captain, I guess, or the colonel. You know, I mean, the, the whoever you would think the person that's in 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 authority at this point of of each tribe. Where they, they, these are ones that were the spies, these are the ones that were sent. And, and I also see that it's very interesting that this is the moment where, where, uh, where Musha, he changed the name of Husha to Yahusha. You know, you know, Husha is salvation, but now we got, you know, Yah is in there with that salvation. He's bringing that salvation. You know, he's tying it at this moment in time. It's an interesting time when he changes the name. Yeah. You know, you know, so that, that's another part that really that really caught my attention in this as you we were reading through it. You know, as I'll, I'll wait on the names as we're going through them, because I'm, I'm looking at uh, the different ones and what their meanings are. And it's it's going to be interesting study. So I'll I'll leave that for now. But I just wanted to point that. Out. Yeah. No, when it comes to to, to Yahushua, I, I definitely want to do a full detailed explanation of that. Matter of fact, I'm going to go into some. Um, some New Testament passages to, to for us to get more clarity on that. Um, but yes, uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful revelation that we're going to see clearly. <laughs> you know, there's no question about what his name is. Um, so let's start looking at these names. Step, Stefan, Jadiel, do you want to throw anything in there? Yeah, um, I think uh, just a combination of looking at the whole picture with Deuteronomy. And seeing that um, that y'all can y'all can do whatever he wants to do, you know. But there's this co-laboring yeah. that he expects when he when he's telling us to walk with him. He wants us to kind of co co-labor with him, not taking over, but he wants us to participate in what he's saying he wants done, you know. And then even though you know the ideas that we have when it lines up with his will it's still in a, in an ultimate sense, not necessary because Yah can do it fully by himself, but for the fact that he hears and answers us and desires our participation with the decisions that's made, we don't need to sit around and say, you know, I'm going to sit in this dark room by myself and wait until Yah tells me exactly what he, when we can actually participate in these decisions every single day you know so this just proves another another aspect of how yah is with us in our decisions he goes with us uh and he definitely was with um you know uh joshua and, and caleb when they went in you know uh, you know this as spies they def he definitely was with them so i just feel like we need to put that that example and apply it to our lives you know when we go and make a decision it's not necessarily have to be the exact thing that Yah says to do, but something that's in line with his will, yeah. he will bless you in and he will go with you to accomplish. You know, even if even if later on it's another picture that he wants you to paint, it doesn't matter because Yah's with you everywhere you go. And that's where we need to kind of keep in mind. But praise Yah. Excellent, excellent. Absolutely. You know, and, and we see that, you know. Uh, just in their suggestion on what to do. They didn't know <laughs> what Yah's will was, but they were in line with it, like he just said. And it may not have been exactly, but Yah liked it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So much that he said, that's, yes, this is what you do, and gave them instruction on how to do it. Very important um, that we understand that. Um, but let's, uh, that's great, brother. So let's, um, Let's look at some of these names, and, I, and there's some interesting things that we're going to pull out here, um, and that I want to bring bring light to uh, because it is necessary for us to to understand. So, uh, in verse four, we start. It says, 
Um, now, these are the names from the tribe of Reuben. Um, uh, Shemua, uh, which comes from the word Shama. Uh, uh, you see the, the, the name, the, the number there. Um, and it means to hear, the Shema, right? Um, verse five, you have Shaphat, um, which means he has judged. Um, verse six is, is interesting to me, and I, and, and I want to park here for a minute, because we have Caleb here, whose origin is outside the children of Israel. This is, this is important, because we always look at, you know, even in this setting, we have these 12 spies, only two of them actually are, are vital to the movement of, of, of the nation as they go forth. They're the only two that make it in. But Caleb is looked at as, as a strong, powerful, and a, a man of faith and always recognized as an Israelite. But his origin is literally, an, it was outside of the children of Israel. Um, it tells us in Joshua, and I'll turn, to, for, turn there for brevity of time. I'll read Joshua chapter 14. It reads this, starting in verse uh, six. It says, then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Jeph the Kizanite. So we see that Caleb, was a Kizanite. He was not an Israelite, but he is counted as one of Israel. Um, the Kizanites were were of the Bedouin um, that lived in the in, in the in the desert. If you remember, um, uh, Abraham met some of the Bedouins as he was traveling through. Bedouins still reside in that region. Um, and they, they're called desert people. They live in the desert. Um, but Caleb's family had attached themselves to the tribe of Judah. And we read earlier in scripture that there would be strangers or um, foreigners that would attach themselves to a tribe and become part of that tribe. They would be just as they were Israelites. Um, so he was a convert. He was a convert, um, but was true to the faith, recognized as an Israelite. Uh, throughout all of scripture and a mighty man of valor and, and one that we should recognize. But I just wanted to point that out because it's interesting for our understanding and for our learning who the Israelites were from the or, from or, origin. Those that believe and followed Yah. Those were who the true Israelites were from the beginning. So um, Kizanites were also mentioned in the land of the people that will be removed from Canaan. You know, we read that in Genesis and I'll hit that a little bit later. Um, but we have Caleb, um, who was a king tonight. His name actually means dog or a dog. Um, verse seven, we have Igal or Yigal, and it means he redeems. Verse eight um, is the interesting one. Um, because we have the word O'Shea or Hosea, which is the same name we see Hosea later on, which means salvation, right? Um, and, and, and in verse 16, you know, we see the change, and we'll talk about that in a second. But in uh, verse 9, we have Pauti, which means escape. Um, verse 10, we have Gadiel, which means L is my fortune. Then we have Gadi, short, the shorter version of Gadiel, which means my fortune. Verse 12, Amiel, which means uh, my kinsman, Elohim. Um, verse 13, we have Sethor, or which comes from Safar, and it means to hide 
or to conceal. Uh, Nabi, um, which comes from Chaba, it's actually pronounced Nakbi, um, and it means to withdraw or to hide. Yayul means, uh, in verse 15, means majesty of El. So these are the, the spies. So in, in verse 16, we see something interesting happen here. We see that it says, these are the names of the men of whom Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, uh, in my translation, it says Joshua. Who has a who has a King James version uh, in front of them? Raise your hand. <clears throat> That's what I'm looking at right now, right on the screen. King, what the, this is the. All right, yeah, but I, I, I want not not with the numbers and everything. I just want to do it with just the the regular text. Go to Hebrews um, chapter four. Okay, so chapter four, three verses eight through eleven. And if Yahusha had given them rest, then would he not words have spoken? Yeah, no, no. So so this is this is not the version. Yeah, no, read it like it says. Just read it like it says. With with the name Jesus in it? Yeah, yeah. Read it with the name. Ah. Yeah. All right. And if Jesus <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, you're asking a lot there, brother. You know, go ahead, go ahead. man. You're okay. <laughs> yeah. Where was I at? And uh, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. I didn't hear. The, I didn't hear. Start in verse eight again. For if. if. <laughs> What are you looking for? Go ahead, brother. What are you looking for? I'll, I'll, say, I'll read it. I'll read Thank you, brother. Thank don't, you. Thank don't, you. Want to, don't want people to go against their conscience. You know, right. They got to stick Pretty strong job, strong to the conscience. I'm, um, I'm, I'm going somewhere here, though. Ja, I think you know what I'm doing. Right. Right, right. So it says uh, in verse 8 of Hebrews 4, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest to the people of Elohim. For he that is entered into his rest, he also have ceased from his own works as Elohim did from his. Uh, verse 11. Yes. Verse 11 says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Right, right. So, so just for context, see, I'm going to read, you know, what this is talking about. Um, this is coming from uh, Hebrews, uh, same book. Um, it says this in chapter three, verse 15, it says, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? <clears throat> so, this is not talking about Jesus, as in Yahushua. All right? This is talking about Joshua. Right? So interesting how the name is interchanged here. They used Jesus in the King James. Some of your, some of your other, uh, like my, my, I use the new King James, they've already corrected it to Joshua. But you see how the, the, the name was not translated or transliterated correctly. And they used Jesus. And if you, if you look it up in the Greek, Iesus, it'll even say Jesus or Joshua. So the name Joshua 
is what it's talking about. So let's look at where this is coming from. Um, Joshua chapter one, it tells us this. Starting in verse 13, it says, um, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of Yahuwah, commanded you, saying, Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on the side on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren, armed all your mighty men of valor, and help them until Yahuwah has given your brethren rest. He gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. And Moses, Yahuwah's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us, we will do, and whatever you send, wherever you send us, we will go. So we see that the Hebrews passage was talking about Joshua. So very important that the name is interchanged here because when we go back to um, Exodus, I mean to uh, uh, Numbers chapter 13, and we read in verse 16 where we are right now, it says, these are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out of the land and Moses called Hosea, meaning salvation, the son of Joshua, which is Yehoshua. Yehoshua, Yahuwah is salvation. So I just wanted to point that out so we understand the origin of the name, you know, because we hear all these goofy things, you know, how the name is tacked together with these suffixes and prefixes. No. The name is Yehoshua. So I just wanted to show where our Savior's name and how the intermingling of the names in the Greek and in the, the Latin are confusing in some scriptures. Because there's another passage, I can't remember where it is, I think it's in Acts, um, that uses that same name. But it's talking about Joshua. And it's because that's what should have been translated or transliterated in the English. Joshua, not Jesus, not Jesus. So just wanted to point that out, that his name was salv salvation, and it went to Yahuwah is our salvation in the name Yahushua. Brother uh, Jadiel. No, I, you, I think you already said it. Um, that point. Is, is very pivotal because it shows the error in that in that uh that name which is not a it's not even derived from greek is derived from latin latin is yeah. derived from the latin um so uh to you know to transliterate the same name same hebrew name in two different ways and there's multiple errors in the in the king james in different spots um with that you know that false uh that false name you know so it's just just imperative that we when we're reading we understand you know depending on what version you're reading and things like that you know people watching that may still be you know reading um the king james can kind of differentiate what's supposed to be there what shouldn't be there and things like that um i also wanted to mention you know i, I know that yahuwah already knew um, that the son of none was going to be, you know, placed in leadership, you know, because of his consistency with, with Moses. So it's interesting that his name before that meant just salvation. Yeah. And because he was going to be the head, he had to now represent the actual head. So he changed his name to Yahuwah is salvation instead of just salvation. Uh, constantly, y'all kept trying to, divert the mind away from man worship to 
Yahuwah worship, you know, same problems came with Moshe, you know, where Moshe had to do certain things in order to move that glory away from himself. And then, you know, and then he hit the rock twice and that kind of affected the faith of, of the rest. But Yahushua is supposed to, you know, represent who is actually leading them into into rest, you know. And Hebrews 4 tells us if that rest was the permanent rest then why are we talking about another day when we will receive rest you see so um i just like the the correlations that you was making yeah absolutely thank you brother that 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 did clarify a little bit even further um you know because i was thinking in in that realm the same way you were just thinking how or just stating how yahuwah wanted to take the focus off a of man i also think that that yahuwah wanted to make sure that in the name of the his head of his army, Joshua, just saying his name, they understood that anything they faced, right? They're going to war, that Yahuwah is their salvation. He is their deliverer, right? And in, in mentioning their general's name, you know, they're saying, when they say his name, Yahuwah is our salvation. We're going to be all right. Caleb knows that. He says it later in the chapter. So, that's a great point because I think it it was also by Moses changing his name, it was a constant reminder of where they got their strength and their health from. And as 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 it says in he in, in, in First Corinthians, this is for our learning. We need to know that too. <laughs> we need to know that Yah is our deliverer, you know, through Yahushua Messiah. You know, so praise Yah for these names and their meanings and, and, and for our understanding uh, to solidify our place in the kingdom. Go ahead, brother. And I know you mentioned Caleb earlier, so I know this kind of will go around in a deeper um, understanding, you know, especially since you mentioned, it mentions Caleb, the son of Jephna. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and or Jafune, or Jaf Jafune, or Close he's enough. actually Close a Kenizzite. <laughs> Jeff, yeah, I'll just say Je I'll just say Jephna. So he's a Kenizzite, which we notice later. Um, you, it tells you exactly where he's from, right. and the Kenizzites was mentioned to Abraham about Yah driving the Kenizzites out of Canaan. Yeah. Um, so he could live in in um, Genesis 15. So uh, Kenaz uh, Kenizzites are not. Israelites, right. nor is there a, a geographical location called Kenaz. There's no place called Kenaz where the Kenazites lived. They lived in Canaan. So you can't, you know, the Kenazites was literally directly connected to the man named Kenaz, which was uh, Esau's great grandson, you know. So uh, this is the reason why Yah had to give him an inheritance with the tribe of Judah after they went into the land because. Um, if he did not do that, then the, the tribes would have got their land and Jake and Caleb wouldn't have received anything. But Yah promised Caleb that he would give him a piece of the land in, in Judah because his family sojourned with Judah from from Egypt. From when they were in Egypt, right. his family connected with the tribe of Judah. So um, just wanted to point that out. And we probably go into that whenever whenever you're ready. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That that was definitely part of it. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for uh, uh, pointing that out as well. Um, Brother Rick. Yeah, I just wanted to point out also when we're talking about Yahushua, which is another interesting connection. He's the son. Well, Husha is the son of Nun, right? Nun means perpetuity, you know? So you got the Yahushua is the son of perpetuity, which is, you know, Yahuwah. I mean, what a, what a, what a dynamic connection <clears throat> giving confirmation to me of the, what the name of the Mashiach is, you know, I mean, it's, it's written right here. And then, and then we see, this is where he's changing it just before he's sending them in, you know, uh, that this, this is an amazing connection. I just thought, so I wanted to share that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, and, and it's important that we, we do that. I, I don't have, you know, usually I have a phrase with the names and what it says, but there's no real phrase here. Um, just that they have, these meanings. And we see that it, it turns out that only two of them 
um, were vital to the movement of Israel at the, in the end anyway. So, um, but but the names definitely mean something in, 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 in accordance with understanding the passage. So, all right, so we have the spies. Um, we have them set out, you know, they're called out. And, and remember, these are different from the names that we talked about before from the leaders. These were set aside to be spies then Caleb and, and, and Joshua became the leaders of, of, of everything. Um, Brother Charles. Yeah, Shabbat Shalom. I just wanted to read, I just got to Dan, but maybe later we can put it all together. I just want to read what I have. Like it's saying, behold the son to hear, remember to hear, judge and govern the freeborn, praise. You said a dog, but okay, praise the dog. He that beholds, there's recompense, the redeemed. He will increase fruitfulness, salvation to propagate or Father Yahushua. And I could go on, but I don't have it all together, but it's it's definitely saying something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I usually I usually do that. I didn't do that with this one. But yeah, no, nah, that that um you know, you're close, brother. <laughs> you're close. Praise you. <laughs> Praise you. Um, Jim. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat> Forgive the basic question in advance, but just for my clarity. Uh, so I understand what you shared about the, the name um, Yahushua. Is, am I saying it correctly? Yahushua, yeah. Yahushua, thank you. So my question is... Uh, why why do you think it is that so many of us use the abbreviated version of his name or or nickname because we often say yahusha and not uh yahu oh now i can't say it again forgive me i'm tired <laughs> right right for for clarity's sake actually it is uh, yahusha the way that it's actually written in this particular section, you know, uh, Yahushua is also used in the scriptures, but in this section, it's actually Yahusha, you know, the, the way that it's spelled letter for letter. If you're looking at it that way, or Husha, you know, would be separate without the, the Yod, you know. So I guess it's just, you know, there's within the brothers here, we were, they interchange those two names, Yahusha or Yahushua, you know. Because we accept them both as, as a form of his name, but you know, as far as the amount of times things are written, Yahusha, two hundred sixteen times, Yahushua two times, in the Tanakh, when you're looking at it the way that it's actually written, letter for letter. So that I hope that helps clarify in this particular section. Right. Somewhat, my wheels wanna, are still spinning. <laughs> I want to also use, <laughs> I want to also use the example of the of the combination of words. So you have the verb yasha. The verb yasha means to save, and then you have, of course, you have Yahuwah. So Yahusha would be the Yahuwah saves. And then you also have the noun that you find in scripture, Yeshua. Yeshua means salvation. And so when you put them together, you have Yahushua for the noun Yahuwah is salvation um this example is shown with um i know many people know elisha elisha's name uh you find elisha's name h477 in uh first king i mean you guys know elisha first kings 19 verse 16 it says his name elisha right um so first kings 19 16 you see elisha Or Eli, Eli, oh, sorry, Elisha, Elisha, which means, um, you know, then we have this one here, H474. Let me see, where is that? Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 15.
Elishua. Give me one second. I also wanted to clarify also some people say that the word Shua means um I forgot what what God what type of God it, it, people say it, it means but the word Shua is an actual Hebrew word um meaning to cry out um so it's not it's not a it's not a word you know like I don't know. I don't know where that that derives from. I just hear it a lot without any explanation. Yeah. They um, so from, Shua is they take not. it from the commandment, um, Bain, um, and then they they say that Yahuwah has a is this is the prefix, and Shua is the is the suffix. So you're not supposed to use Yahushua. <laughs> so they're they're putting together something oh. that doesn't go together. To come up with a false understanding, that's what they're doing. Mm. Okay, okay, because I I heard it a lot, and I kept trying to find what 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 was being said, but I couldn't find it. But anyway, yeah, yeah, that's why. Yeah, it's so um, to the origin yeah. of where it's first mentioned, when we see Joshua, and we match it up, Yahushua, we see the original name. <laughs> There's no question there. Praise, yeah. Right. Um, you got more, Jadio? Oh, no, no, no. I was just um, just going over some notes I haven't looked at in a long time, so I'm just looking at it again. Praise, yeah. Praise, yeah. Yeah, keep the notes because I see more hands, brother. <laughs> um, <laughs> Stefan. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so Caleb's name means dog, but I wanted to elaborate a little bit more from my understanding. Um, breaking down his name using the Hebrew letters, it's uh, Kaf, Lamed, and um, Beit. Um, Kaf meaning open hand, uh, to curve, to bend to one's will or allow. Lamed in terms of the authority, the walk, bait, you know, the house of Yah. It's interesting because uh, I'm sure later when we get to the next chapter, verse 24, it says that Caleb, <clears throat> he had a different spirit and he followed Yah completely. So he allowed himself based off his of his name, which is his function, based off the letters that we just broke down. He allowed himself to be under the authority in the house of Yah, or, you know, under the authority of the son of Yah, uh, to be in his house, um, you know, making him loyal. And, and then I compare that to what we just say, you know, his name is just dog. It's like, what does a dog do? You know, a dog is, is loyal, is bent to the master's will, Man, and it's safe and it's in the house, right? So I thought that was interesting. And the fact that it was him and Yahusha who came back they're the only two who came back and said, yeah, we could take these guys, you know, and everybody else meant like, you know, fear and stuff. So, yeah, just thought it was interesting. Absolutely. I saw that, too, um, in looking at and looking at dog, you know, in, in regards to that. We have we have an Akita. Most people know that, you know, they're supposed to be one of the most loyalist dogs that there are, you know, to to their owners. Um, there's a, a historical fact of a dog named Hachi in, in Japan that um, used to walk with his owner to the um, train station every day. So um, this one particular day, he went to the train station as he normally does. Um, and his owner had a heart attack at work. So the Akita stayed there for months, <laughs> rain, snow, sleet, shine. Even when he did finally leave, he kept coming back waiting for his owner, his master to come back. So just a picture in the loyalty and I think matches with what Stefan was saying. Um, Sister Diane. I 
Uh, okay. uh, Shalom family. Um, great teaching again. Uh, this is a really good. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. I um, th This spelling, and I'm not going to go, you know, too much with this because we have a lot to cover here. You know, depending upon what version um, you're looking at, uh, the spelling of the name and transliteration and all, um, like the KJV, for instance, and Brother Jadiel did touch on, we, we need to be careful. You know, it's good to search the scriptures and to perhaps even different versions to see how it's being read. Um, well, let me go back a second, Brother um, Eldera. You mentioned um, you were talking about the lineage of, of Caleb. Did you also mention Bedouin? That really was my first question. And yeah, then yeah. I have another. Okay. Yeah, the Bedouins, the Bedouins uh, resided in the desert in a, in a, in a plain. All right. And, and the you, Bedouins were Kishonites? Kish, Kishnozites? Kinzonites. Kinzonites. Yeah. So the Bedouins were Kinzonites. Or, or was it the other way around? Was well, were the better ones a clan of the Kenzanites, Kenozites? Right, they were. Right, they were. Oh. So they weren't the better ones. The better one is a culture. Oh, okay. So, so the Kenzanites, some of the Kenzanites were living in a better one type of culture. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, let me write that down before I forget. Um, all right. Thank you for clarifying that. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So like the LXX, the Septuagint, for instance, back to um, uh, Jaush, Yahusha, um, the LXX spells his name J-O-S-H-U-A. So how would that be pronounced? Um, you know, we know that the LXX, you know, Septuagint is older than the Greek or any of the other ones. So how would that be pronounced? Joshua, but there was no J then. So what it right, right. In, the, so, in right. the Greek? You mean in um, the Greek? In the Okay, yeah, and, and, I, and I believe you mentioned Latin also, Brother Jadia, but yeah, yeah, we know that the J did not uh, exist, so, you know, we can substitute the J for the H in the Septuagint, and uh, so how would that be pronounced, H-O-S-H-U-A? Actually, Husha is the way that it's... <clears throat> Hosea, Hosea or Hosea? No, actually, let me show you, I'll show you what I'm talking about, because that's actually uh, Ua or Bob, if you will, as some say, that's written there. If you look at this in the Strong's Husha, it's the, the hey, mm -hmm. in the east. Husha. No, Husha, that's a U. Yeah, I, I was just saying that the LXX uh, spells it H-O-S-H-U-A. It doesn't spell it H-O-S-H-U-A. Right no, but the LXX spells it H O S H. U A and not H O S H E A. So um, when you're going back to the older text, I, I'm just when I'm doing this, you know, for my own level of understanding. Well, it's, at, it's spelled differently. I'm just looking at the Hebrew letters here, not necessarily the English spelling. So if I look at the actual Hebrew letters that are written here, you got a a, a hey, a ua, a, a, a sheen, and a yin. So that's to me spells husha, you know. Uh -huh. And let me speak also in this. Uh, let me stop the sharing on this one. I think I don't think you can see it on that one. Well, let me bring it back to the the, the uh, sword. And this is uh, if we look at the same name where it changed here. Um, what they have Yehusha, if you will. Um, we can see the two names written up in here. Uh, I can't move the cursor, but you can see how it's written two ways. That's what I was talking about, Sister June. You have the the the, the same two names, Yod Hey Ua Shianaim, which is Yahusha or Yahusha, and then we have the Yod Hey Ua Shian Ua Ayin, which is Yahushua. So the same word they use, they they have it interchangeable in there. 
that's why I say we we use the same the two different names, but they're the same Strong's number, if you will. So it's spelled that way both ways. That's what confuses things, but that's why I say Yahusha. Because I think that that goes with uh, again dialect and and pronunciation, and because you know many of us say Torah or Torah, but that's a ua there too. You know, people should say tura. That's not you know. There's a lot of words with the with the vav in certain places that's not given the u sound, but it's just it's kind of like you know we would need a, like a template of of whether or not they have to always sound this way, or the hey has to always give the huh sound or the ah sound. Which one should it always give? You know, um, you know just to just to lay down like if we can find like something that's absolute where it's always ua instead of o or you know i think those are really close to to kind of you know be okay let's let's look into it or or, or something like that but uh i'm not sure if i have 100% with the u all the time so i kind of it's kind of like u o and then on top of that, how we pronounce it, we're we're Americans. So right. or we're 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 2001 ians You know, even if you're not from America originally, we don't have ancient Hebrew dialect in our throats, you know. So uh just letting everybody know, you know, not to not to be a pronunciation police and, yeah, and yeah. we're not we don't even have the same throat as that they had back in the days. So. Right, 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 right. Oh, oh I'll say, you know, I'm I'm gonna call him what his mama called him. Yahushua. <laughs> brother, uh, brother, uh, I got quite a few names here. Some Samek Lamed Bav Aleph. Who was that? Those are letters. I know, but who is it? Is the question. What? It's Ina. It's uh. <laughs> Is this oh, silver? Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's how you spell silver. That's some of the letters that are in silver. If you were to put this. Yeah. You forgot the ooh. Because we're, yeah. because we're because we're trying to uh restore that with our speaking. So we're like writing our name and trying to learn like what our name would be. Um but I, I, you, Jadio already said it. I don't know if somebody saw me put my laughing face up. Um, because I've met people who are so dogmatic about this, that is absolutely ridiculous. Like they won't fellowship with people who say, um, Yahusha, like they feel the need to like correct people if they don't say Yahushua and they say, yeah, like it just, it becomes so out of control that it's almost comical. And I'm sitting there like, really? That's the point that like you, you can't fellowship with your brother now because he didn't say Yahushua and they're unrighteous. And I just, sometimes, I mean, I know it's not funny because it's really sad, but it just cracks me up because I'm like, really? <laughs> and Johnny already said it, like, why are you going to be the pronunciation police? I mean, I'm not understanding. <laughs> There's so many other things that we need to dig through. Um, especially about our everyday living and like you going, it reminds me of that scripture where Yahushua said, you're going to like pit the net out of your brother's eye, right? And you got this big beam in your <laughs> you're just like nitpicking with them. Because I, I literally have met people like that and they refuse to fellowship with other people. And I'm just like, that's why you don't talk to them? Wow. You know, so I'm just glad that this fellowship doesn't indulge in that. And yep. we, we just have good conversations surrounding things. And, you know, I think that's how you learn and you grow, you know. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, 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 you know, and, and, you know, I said it earlier, the, you know, the goofies, you know, they put the, the suffix and the prefixes. And that's what I was talking about, you know. Um, but I think I think it's definitely um you know, good for us to to search these things out and to talk them out so we understand the language and not be dogmatic about those things because we are a body and and you know all of us here, most of us used to say Jesus. You know what I mean? Yesterday. So, you know, we gotta make sure that we're 
being sensitive to the new understanding that we now have and the ability to search and look at these words and understand the language and you know it it really gets hairy if you get too caught up in the weeds of pronunciation um so praise ya uh june Shabbat Shalom. I, I was, I was kind of glad to hear you say that, Sister Ina, because I too have observed that within pe people of our similar faith. Because I help moderate comments sometimes on on YouTube specifically, and it, you know, <laughs> and these are supposed to be fellow brothers and sisters in the body, and they're not even weighing in on the actual content of the video it could be you know about yeah you know the birds that yahuwah created and the comment will be his name isn't yahuwah it's this <laughs> it's like i call them the name police and it's just it's very divisive and i don't even understand you know are people literally just spending time going around just you know, trying to correct everyone to their own personal understanding of how to pronounce the name, you know, and it's, it's kind of disturbing uh, sometimes too, because it distracts, you know, and takes away from, you know, like we can all agree, you know, whatever the letters are in Hebrew, you know, you know, we may say that different, but, but we agree it's that <laughs> you know what i'm saying like we can unify on on that like that's a that's the that's what could pull us all to the same page and so i just um yeah i, I call them the name police uh so it's funny uh brother jadiel said said pronunciation police uh but but nonetheless it's a, it's a good discussion to have and and obviously the name of our father is really, really important, you know, but yeah, people, they, they can even be condemning in a way too, you know, because uh, you're just have, trying to have a normal conversation. And like, like you said, Rod, they'll try to put suffixes or, or, or say, well, this suffix is in the strong. So if you pronounce it this way, you're call, you're saying the Messiah is nothing, <laughs> you know, uh, these kinds of things. And we have, I think we have to be careful too. some of the, the video content we consume because people who are, you know, not that we can't learn from one another. I, I learned from everyone in this fellowship on an ongoing basis. It's beautiful. I love the way we study, but we have to, to re be mindful to vet the information and not just to view something, because anybody can make a presentation and it sounds wonderful and it sounds good, but until you go, like, like Brother Jadiel said, he kept hearing over and over this certain idea that if you, the Shua was the pagan God, or I can't remember what he said exactly, but he couldn't find it when he went to search to see if that was true. You know, he's being a Berean, you know, and it's a, and it's a it's a sober re, you know reminder that we have to individually be responsible for for vetting things and and not get caught up in group think so to speak, particularly on the YouTube verse universe. Absolutely, absolutely. We we can uh, you know get lost. Um, I've seen you know many brothers go astray because of YouTube and uh, not really understanding and doing their own research. So praise y'all for that. Um, all right, Charles, and then Sister Diane, and then we'll we'll try to finish out the chapter. Oh, I was just going to say, I just wanted to read. I was just hoping we would finish with all those names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, brother, you can read. Let me let me let Sister Diane go, and then, um, and then you can read the rest of the chapter, and we'll discuss it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I brought up the aspect of the LXX simply because um, it's an older version and the name was spelled differently. I don't know if the Strong's uh, correlate to the um, LXX or what, but 
Um, June said it best uh, just a second ago when she mentioned groupthink. One thing we don't really want to be um, guilty of is groupthink. Like if you don't use it, uh, if you don't say it or pronounce it this particular way, then you're not a part of us or we don't want you around because as we all know, um, assemblies have broken up, you know, for that very reason all behind um, the way the name is pronounced. So I think it's very important. I don't know uh, how many remember the story behind, I can't call the guy's name right now, uh, when, when he said, well, can't we all but just get along, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that's, that's, you know, that's really what it all boils down to, you know, can we all just get along? Oh, Rodney, um, Rodney King. Yeah, Rodney King. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they beat him up pretty bad. He but said, Hey, well, can we trying to dissipate the riots connecting to the verdict for the police officers that beat him. So he just wanted everything to stop. So. What perfect analogy there. That's that's a that's a perfect life application. You know, we just you know, we just want to be able to get along um, with with um, these type of conversations because there is a lot of variance and uh, a lot of dissension, you know, with that the way this is pronounced. I just wanted to add that in there. I wasn't trying to make a point that his name is pronounced one way or the other. Yeah, no, nah, I, I don't think any of that was directed towards you. That was that was just in general. We we we've we've had people act. I, I use the word goofy. Maybe I shouldn't use that word, but sometimes it can be a little goofy. <laughs> you know, like you're coming up with these ideas, and you you not only not only do you believe them, you want us to believe them too. So come on with that. Um, but I think uh, in general, you know, we have to make sure that we are protectors of our minds being renewed by something outside of the word that it doesn't say, you know? And I think when you add and, and put things together that aren't together in scripture, you run the risk of doing that. We can, we can, we can make words up by putting things together that don't mean that in scripture. Um, and that's the, that's the um, thing. And I chuckled there because I just remember the way he said, you know, can't we all just get along? Kind of, he kind of like whimpered it um, in watching, you know, what was going on with all the people being beaten in the streets and the looting. So, um, all right. So we got our brother Charles is going to read um, verse 17 um, to the end of the chapter. And we'll just kind of talk. There's a lot of things in there, though. We might not finish, but let's um, let's go ahead and read it. And then we'll talk about talk about it. Man, you want me to read to the old chap? <laughs> well, what, what verse we start in 17? Um, there's uh, 16 verses left. So we read the first 16. Let's read the last 16. All right. Um, then Moshe sent, sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south. And go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak. Few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin, as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron, Haman, Shisha, and tell me the descendants of Anak were there, were there, my bad. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came to the valley of Ishkol and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. 
They carried it between two of them in the pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called the Valley of Ish Ishko because of the clusters which the men of Yasharal cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now they departed and came back to Moshe and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Yasharal in the wilderness of Paran at the Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of all the land, of the land, I'm sorry. And they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Enoch there. The, the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moshe and said, let us go, let us go up at once and take possession for we, for we are all well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Yasharal a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people who we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. <clears throat> Praise God, brother. <clears throat> Anything you want to pull out that stood out to you or? Not yet, I'll, I'll come back. I was, I was just trying to read it out. Praise God, yeah, no, no, that's good, that's good. Thank you, thank you, Charles. Um, Man, so what's going on here, family? You know, we got um, them being obedient to the father and going out and, like we said earlier, surveying the land. Um, and, they're, and they're looking into this land um, and they see some things. Um, some of them see some things that bewilder them, that, that, that make them afraid even. Um, and, you know, <laughs> they see everything as being huge uh, and destructive um, for them. And, 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 and they, they voice these things. So there's some interesting things that are going on here um, as we look at this. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to look at um, was the, the reality of what they're saying. The sons of Anak, you know, verse 21 says, and they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. Verse 22, and they went up <clears throat> through the south and came to Hebron, Ahiman, Shashi, Talaman, where the descendants of Anak were there, right? So we have these descendants of Anak that were a tribe of uh, giants. You know, as we continue to read through scripture, we'll see, you know, the Rephim, the Anakim, uh, the Zumim, um, the Emims, and the Thorims, all tribes of giants. And I, I believe that the, the I believe and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Philistines were from Anakim as well. Um, they were Anakites or Anakim. They were from Anak. Um, but there's, I did some, some, some reading in history 
Um, and there were some English settlers that went to Bashan. You remember Bashan, Aga Bashan, who was the chief of the giants. Um, but they 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 went and they looked at some of the historical buildings there, and they were they found buildings with 18 feet ceilings, um, with the doors had hinges um, that were six feet long. Um, and they said that Og's bed or his coffin was 13 feet long. Um, um, a lot of a lot of information about giants. Um, you know, there's uh, I wish Sister Lisa Zapata was here to see if um, she knew anything about um, Native Americans often talk about uh, um, uh, giants. Uh, 20 feet tall. There's this book, I can't remember the name of it, that talks about Native American stories where they talked about their ancestors constantly reminding them of 20 feet tall giants that used to run beside the buffalo and literally reach over and rip them apart uh, as they ran, you know, using buffalo for food, ripping their limbs off. Um, they talk about them cursing Yah. Um, and trying to climb up to the mountains when Yah sent his great flood and the great flood even went past the mountains and drowned, um, mimicking the story of, of Noah Noah and Genesis. So um, we have this, this, this idea of large men, taller in stature than, than the rest. Um, and, I, and, I, and it made me want to look at some things in regards to um, the Philistines, um, and I and I read some things um, in um, First Samuel that were quite interesting, and I, I'll go to go ahead, uh, Charles. I'll I'll turn to what I'm reading. Yeah, um, when I came to y'all, you all, I, that's when I found out that um, the fallen angels they 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 didn't mate with humans because spirits don't have. Um, I don't know if kids on here, but they don't have the, the tadpoles. You get what I'm saying? Right. See what no, I'm trying to say? Right. You know, yeah, the, the, the passages, the passage in Genesis 6 is, is often misinterpreted um, in that way. Um, right. So. Mm -hmm. Right. So when it came to the Giants, now I'm hearing that, like, this can go into a whole lot of discussion. It says 20 feet giants and all that. Now, I didn't I didn't think so. I thought it was just maybe they were just maybe eight or nine feet tall or something like that. That's why they were considered giants. So now this goes back into why all the other beliefs have half man, half animals. And where we get the story of Babylon and all the other beliefs, they all believe the same thing. Like you said, the Indians. And I believe, like I said this before, I believe Genesis gave us the reason why all these other beliefs come together is because the world was together in Peleg's day and doing Nimrod. Nimrod and Peleg was that probably at the same time. And this is where you get all the temples and everything and all the more saying we was all over in America already, but we wasn't in America. The world was together. That's why they was able to walk across and have the same beliefs and stuff. And they was building up. And I believe that's where you get all the giants stories from. Yeah, so just just to be clear, so the, the 20 feet giants, that's that's a that's based on tradition of passing down stories. They may not have actually been 20 feet tall. You know, if you see something completely huge and taller than you in stature, you may exaggerate a little bit. So that's not in scripture. That's that's just based upon those historical stories. Jadiel and then Brian. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say the same thing. Like, you know, when you're looking at content from a pagan perspective, you got to, you know, just because they say that there's a spirit in the clouds doesn't mean there's a spirit or Native Americans believe that there's a spirit, an actual being in in nature, you know, or in the earth or in the buffalo. Yeah. Doesn't mean that there's like a, an entity in those things, you know, so. I think sometimes we, we look at those things as proof right. to to the idea that's going around. And um, 
especially when it's outside of Moses, you know, especially Moses writing about Genesis and um, everything is kind of focal around Torah and the prophets, Moses and the prophets. And then there's, you can't really establish any anything in that realm uh, besides they were giants. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like you can't establish the stories that you hear from other books, Native American books and things like that. You, even the flood, like you have, what's that guy? G G Gilgamesh? Yeah. Uh, Gilgamesh with the big flood, you know, all these things. And I, that's why I agree with what Charles is saying. All these people that experience those things, but went away from Yah is now receiving or distorting the history making it into like folklore exaggerations you right. know because they were i believe like what charles said they were there at the same time so when they experienced these it was an actual historical reference but then as time went on and as they started to believe their their pagan their pagan beliefs it started to seep into the history turned history into like a, a comic book or something yeah no that, that's true and i think i think even in the sense of you know, us going through warfare, you know, you have Caleb and, and Joshua, mostly Caleb, saying, nah, we can go up and defeat them. And the other 10, they were like, nah, we're like grasshoppers, you know, to them, you know, that can be even an exaggeration because what ails us or what looks like it's going to defeat us seems larger than it actually is. And I think, um, not to say that they weren't giants, but just to say, you know, the exaggerations come with, with the stories as well in agreement with what you were saying. Right. Yeah, praise God. I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah praise God. I want to look at a passage in First Samuel, but I'm going to let Brian go first. Go ahead, brother. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. No, I was just listening to the description of the fruit. The um, It says uh, the cluster of grapes one cluster of grapes was so huge it took two men to carry it with a pole between them yeah and that i mean that's like that i don't know about anybody else but i've never seen a cluster of grapes like that that is that is a huge cluster of grapes like yeah it, it just goes to show like the the fertileness of the land like it says it's a land full of milk and honey and it's okay. like yeah. you got land so fertile that's producing fruit like this it's a that's like tremendous um but as far as the um uh, i wanted to comment about the 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 giants the uh the uh, what they say they compared themselves to grasshoppers and, and they were, they felt like grasshoppers in their sight um, there's one passage in Amos that I thought was interesting. It's spoken, uh, I believe Yahuwah is talking here. Um, he talks about the uh, this time that they're going through, uh, referring back. And uh, it's Amos chapter 2, verse 9. Um, and it says... Uh, it says, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yeah. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his, his roots from beneath. Also, I brought you up from the land of Mitzrayim and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. So I was like, I know, I know sometimes people, you may say that, they were exaggerating as far as the height of these men uh, feeling like they were grasshoppers in their sight. But here, like when you look at the like, like cedar trees, I looked it up, it's like cedar trees can get over a hundred feet tall. And I'm, I'm not saying that these, these giants were that tall, right, right. but this is like Yahuwah himself speaking about this, like this time of them, of him, them, hell, of himself delivering them from the Amorites and describing the height of these people we're not talking about no eight or nine ten feet tall people these were extremely large uh people although they were large that's not no excuse for the the uh uh 
the spies because they they had Yahuwah with them with uh, like the church says y'all y'all before us who can be against us so but um but yeah I was just like I, I kind of know sometimes we, we can be you might see that and be like oh they're exaggerating stuff like that but I don't I'm not so sure <laughs> when I look at this this account in Amos so I just wanted to bring yeah. that out yeah well yeah I don't I mean I, I I hear you in Amos so I'm not sure um I'm not sure of that 100 feet tall. I mean, we know that Goliath um, was six, it says six cubits in 1 Samuel, which was about nine, between nine and 10 feet tall. So that's a far cry from 100. You know, so that's all I'm saying. You know, sometimes when we go, you know, and I, I think the picture that I'm painting, not so much that they're exaggerating that these men are tall, but exaggerating how tall they are. In other words, when we look at a problem, when we're going through warfare, when we don't put Yah in it, it's huge. When we put Yah in it, it becomes small. That, that's more so the, 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 the effect I was trying to um, get us to an understanding that these writings are for us to understand even what we're going through now. So that's pretty much what I was talking about. But, but Goliath that is talked about being so tall was on was not between nine and ten feet tall according to scripture. Um Jadiel and Ina and Charles. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, not to get into like like the numbers of you know what size a tree is and things, but if you if you you know just looking at Amos 2 verse 9, it continues with the exaggeration I, I would say you know when it says yet destroyed I the Amorite before him whose height is like the height of cedars and who's as strong as oaks and then look at how he describes it, it says yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath you know so it's still given that tree description in reference to what he had to do what he had to do to destroy them you know um, there's not fruits growing off of a per this person's head. There's not roots growing at from the bottom of their feet, you know. So in order to keep that verse consistent, you can't take the first part and say they really were the size of the actual trees. And then the next part of the verse is saying that they are actually the trees and he had to cut the fruit and the roots off, you know. So it is an exaggeration because um, he's not really cutting fruit off of their heads he's 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 probably just killing them but um you know just to just to look at the language of how they spoke it wasn't like this is exactly how they are this is how they can describe it it's kind of like daniel describing these kingdoms as beasts you know it's not an actual beast that's going to come out of the water but it's a, the description plays a part in the characteristics of that beast you know, so uh, I would say Amos chapter two, verse nine, likewise, he, he continues to play on the characteristics of a tree, even to the point of him destroying the, the giant saying he's going to cut the fruit off and the roots off, you know, so I, I would say it has to be an exaggeration because he's not really cutting roots off of a person and fruits off of a person, you know, so, um, but as I'm not negating the possibility of the size is just that to establish a hundred percent absolute the number of size you, i don't think that it's possible um but i'm not denying you know how tall they are or possibly are but we have an exact tallness of a couple giants you know in scripture goliath and his brothers yeah yeah that's um, so, exactly where i was going actually yeah yeah go ahead bro. yeah no nah, the, the passage that i was going to read was was going to describe that um, but yeah, nine, 10 feet tall. And then we have, you know, scripture itself speaks in imagery, you know, all through scripture where things are likened unto for our understanding. So um, again, doesn't negate their, their height, but we do have, you know, Goliath's height and his brothers, Jadiel kind of ruined where I was going, but uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, that's, that's, that's good helps us understand, um, you know, what they look like um, to the eyes of the spies as well. Um, Ina, 
Charles, and then I'll go into the passage I was going to go into. Uh, shalom, shalom. I was just going to put out there it's good to um, research like um, archaeological evidence and things like that. If you're interested in knowing more about this topic, um, the Smithsonian is one of the places that has some archaeological evidence, but I wouldn't stop with just them. Um, there's lots of information out there with the age of the internet. Um, you have to, of course, triangulate that evidence, cross-reference it um, with other sources, but you can find out quite a bit um, from doing that um, surrounding height and size, but again, uh, height and size to, I don't want to say it's a mute point because it's not because we don't want to exaggerate and we also don't want to be in a point where we just don't believe. Um, and I think that the overall point that Yahoo was pointing to was that no matter how big the problem is, right. so I'm not, negating, I'm not negating how tall they were, I'm of a different belief because I've done a different level of research to find that they were they, they have some evidence out there. They were, were pretty pretty big. Um, but the, the, the point being is not how big they were. I think that becomes like a, a contention where people argue, well, they weren't that big. They weren't that. But then they're still missing what Yahoo was saying, which is what Rod was bringing out. Because I was almost about to put my hand down. Because uh, I was like, eh, I don't want to argue that point. But then it was, it, it was still needed to be said, research. Um, but don't forget that the underlying point from Yahuwah is, I don't care if it is 100 feet tall. Not saying that it was. I'm still bigger than that. So don't make an issue where for Yah, there is no issue. Because there's nothing that he can't conquer. And if I've called you to be my people, I don't want you looking around at problems like I can't fix it. Because that becomes an insult to him. It becomes it becomes a direct insult to him because I'm saying I have all faith and confidence and trusting you. But then when I look at this problem now, all of a sudden I'm scared and I'm shaking in my boots because it, it looks big to me. We have to remember our father's perspective. I don't care how big it is. <laughs> you know, he, he made everything. He is in control of everything. There's nothing that he can't handle. So I have to hide myself in that understanding um, rather than measuring up the problem, per se. Um, he, he, he was making that very clear in, in Amos, you know, listen, I, I, I'm not about the size of, of none of these issues. I'm y'all. I, I need you to be with me. I need you to understand who I am, what I sent you to do. And then I need you to do, it, you know? And so that's, even when we first started this, this was like, mm, my mind is turning. Am I still looking at stuff in my life that way? And if I am still looking at things in my life that way, father, y'all deliver me that I don't ever look at anything like you can't do it, Father. I, I need to just be obedient. And then just like Dawi, right? I'm going to slay some giants, definitely, because that's what I'm about, you know, like almost aggressive like that. Because Dawi was like, yeah, no, I don't know why y'all running, but I'm not running because I don't know who he think he is coming up in my camp doing that. So... <laughs> I just wanted to put it out there. We got to be strong and courageous. Even as Joshua said, no matter what it looks like, be strong and courageous. Great job. Yeah, no, absolutely. <clears throat> we definitely have to see uh, the greater picture um, because as in the beginning, we looked at <clears throat> understanding that this is the book of warfare, right? And we know that this is for us to understand. Um, so all things they faced, uh, will face um, in a similar manner. And the naming of Hosea, O'Shea, to Yehoshua was a direct um, point of reference. So they always understood that Yahuwah was their salvation. He was the one that was going to deliver them from any issue if they believe and trusted in him. Um, so good point, sister. Um, but but it's a good conversation nonetheless because some of these particular passages, you know, are rough to get through, and we hear these different things and we read these different things. So it's good to have the conversation so we can, I'll use your word, triangulate 
all of this information to the truth um, so that we can uh, be on one accord as well and, and, and be speaking um, intelligently about what the scriptures are actually saying. So praise you um, Brother Charles. Shalom. Yeah, um, I was kind of looking at this like because a lot of brothers, whether they Yasharolites or people like Moors or whatever, I run into all of these guys and they, they try to articulate and say the Bible is this and that. And they always come at you like, well, your people, y'all people stole the land and this and that. And I, I just look at it like this, like I try to I try to look at it like this. Um, you all say you stole the land, but what the problem is, is we didn't do nothing. Y'all did it. And then he allowed us to go into bondage everywhere around the world. Now every every belief or wherever they say they were, they seen us going to bondage and they seen him get us out of bondage. And this world, the whole world, was together at once during Peleg Day. I mean, the whole earth was together. All their beliefs and everything. And they built all these temples. And as if they was, they seen y'all do all this. So now... They can't say that it isn't real and they know it he real. So this is why they try to keep his people down because they know it's a report throughout the whole world, throughout all the generations. He got his people out of bondage, wherever they were. So when you look at it, that's why the whole world is against his people and his belief because they know the word is true. And, and when I look at this, what I'm, what I'm really trying to get at when I look at this, is as if um I, I forgot I lost my thought train, train of thought. That's all right. That's <laughs> no problem, brother. You know, but you know, and just to follow up on that, you know, his people, uh, those that trust, believe in him, keep his law, statutes, commandments. Those are his people. Um, so praise you as we saw in, in, in the whole Caleb situation. Um but I wanted to just look at this passage real quick because um, I never saw this before, uh, but I was looking at it. Um, this is in um, Jadiel kind of hinted to, 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 the, to the summation of it a minute ago. <clears throat> but in 1 Samuel chapter 17, it says this, and you guys know what this is. This is when <clears throat> Goliath comes and they're looking for someone to fight Goliath. And David is there. It says in verse 40, it says, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he, disclaimed, he disdained him, um, or disclaimed, disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, I am a dog that you come, or am I a dog that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give you your, your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Um, so you know how the story goes. Um, David puts a, a, a stone in a sling, hits him in his forehead um, uh, and kills Goliath, cuts off his head, right? So, but it always, you know, intrigued me that he, he picked up five stones. Um, it only took one to kill Goliath. So why did he need five? Um, so uh, look at this passage here in 2 Samuel. Chapter 21. So there were four stones left, right? So Jody already said Goliath's brothers. So there were five of them that, that I guess David intended to slay. Because um, it says in verse 16 of, of chapter 21, 
it says um it says this it says uh where am i oh it says oh first let's start in verse 15 when the philistines were at war again with israel david and his servants with them went down and fought against the philistines and david grew faint then ishbi benab who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zoriah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. So we got one giant killed. So that's two. That's two stones gone. Uh, verse 18. Now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistine at Gob, and Shebekai, the Heshite, killed Saph, who was one of the sons of the giant. All right, so that's three stone. Verse 19, again, there was a war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhan, the son of Jahara, or Jari Oregin, the Bethlehemite, killed killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite. The shaft whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And then in verse 20, yet again, there was a war at Garth where there was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also was born to the giant. So he defined or defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother killed him. Verse 22, these four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of the servant. So we see there were five giants um, from the Philistines that David intended to kill, I guess, with those five stones here, the other four were slayed as well. So I just thought that was a fun fact that, uh, that I that, 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 that I was intrigued to to see, you know, as I was looking at giants. Um, you know, and as we come to a close for this chapter, as we're looking at, you know, all of the things that were going on, you know, we talked earlier about Genesis, you know, where the promise was made, and he tells them. Genesis chapter 15. says this in verse 18. <clears throat> it says, um, on the same day, Yahuwah made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadomites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephium, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershites, and the Jebusites. These were all in the land. These are who had to be moved um, for Yahuwah to give them. So they knew ahead of time that it wasn't just a land that was blank for them to go into. They had to fight. Yahuwah's uh, army had to fight to get them removed so they can uh, envelop the land. So just wanted to kind of show those things um, and how we're seeing now um, the promise is coming into fruition as they're coming into the land. So um, praise Yah. Um, anything, anyone want to add anything else uh, for chapter 13? All right, no hands. Praise Yah, this concludes um, our Torah reading today. Um, Numbers chapter 13. Oh, got it, yo. Oh, yeah, no, I'm sorry. I clicked it too late. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out just the, you know, just the, just the, the confidence that that they had in, um, you know, in in Yah's promise, 
you know, uh, how the other 10 were kind of so focused on what things look like. They didn't really, re they didn't really st stick to the, the actual first statement. I think when you, when we first started, you said you went to Deuteronomy and you showed that Yah told them that it's, it's all theirs. Yeah. It's all theirs. Go in and possess it. And then that they're the ones that said, let's spy it out first. So <laughs> it seems like, you know, the 10, I'm not sure which ones were the ones that said, let's go spy it out first. But obviously the 10, even spying it out, saw saw something that they felt was was too much for Yah. Yeah. And now we see Joshua and Caleb was more along the lines of, this is already ours. It's already ours because he already said it's ours. And I think that that's, to me, that's extremely admirable because we see that they go into the wilderness <laughs> because of their unbelief of taking it. And it brings me to just look at Caleb and Joshua, like, just think about what they had to endure, like being with them for 40 more years when they could have went in at that point. And they believed that they could have went in. But Yah saw that he needed them, the ones that believed the most, to lead the rest. So even though they were able to go in, they stuck with their people and they led them, you know, through the wilderness. So just just more, I just admire them a little bit more with, with their 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 integrity and their and their love for their people, you know, their love for others. We were just talking earlier about pronunciation police or the name police how people lose fellowship because of names and and not even names pronunciation and and we see joshua and caleb could have been like nah y'all y'all die in the wilderness I'm, i could go in <laughs> yeah yeah but instead they go ahead and wander with them lead them through wars lead them through the teachings and understandings and you know caleb leading the army and for 40 more years you know, and, and Yah blessed him so much that Caleb was 80 and he was still like he was in his 20s leading the army. And um, so I just want I just I just want to show that characteristic that Yah already gave it to them. They wanted to do something else. And even when they went in, Joshua Caleb said, yeah, 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 it's ours still. It doesn't matter what obstacles is in there. It's ours already. And others were more along the lines of now nah, is not that big. Yeah, it's not that strong, you know. Um, we need to do something else. They started coming into the logical, the logical mindset of the earthly, the earthly mindset. And I think that that's where we got to understand our earthly logic does have nothing to do with what Yah is able, able and capable of doing. And I think we need to kind of keep those two things separate: the logic of what we see and understand. And the possibility of what Yah is able to do needs to be totally separate. And we need to submit to what Yah is able to do so we can walk in faith of what Yah is able to do and not what we know on earth what man can't do. You know, so praise Yah. Uh, brother, those are those are great insights um, in regards to the ultimate picture. Um, you know, one of the things we have to make sure that we do is apply all of what we're reading to our lives, you know, because we're faced, um, you know, in, in a sense, different, you know, realm, not realm, but a different um, circumstances, but the same type of, of, of trial, you know, these are types of things that we're going to go through. Um, and we have to trust in him the, the same way, you know, you know, that not, not to mention, you know, you mentioned how, you know, they had to wait for 40 more years, but just, you know, with the whimpering and complaining and the whining, you know, when they were men of stature to have to witness and probably try to help teach, you know, those men to come up to their same understanding, you know, by their leadership um, was important as well. So praise you. Um, Jim. Shalom. I was going to ask after the recording but i'll ask now uh the when 
I'm trying to think of how to word the question. When, so, so was, was there a specific reason why Yahuwah, you know, set or earmarked the promised land for them to be a land that other people were already in? Like, you know, like, you know, because they were, it took them a long time to get there. You know, he could have sent those people away or, or promised them a land where no one else was already at, or, or even in, in Egypt, like, well, you know, I know he was rescuing them, but like he could have sent the Egyptians away, but I know he didn't have that land for them. So th these are just thoughts of running through my mind. You, you, you want me is okay, Rod? Yeah, I was on mute. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Oh, okay. Um, well, the, the, well, the specific land was a promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's fulfilling the promise to the forefathers. Um, that's why it's a specific location, because that's where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived um, before they went into, into Egypt. Um, he, the interesting thing is he did promise to drive them out. That's what he promised. <laughs> he promised to do that. So they were supposed to walk it out in faith and see ya, uh, see ya uh, do it. But instead, they they took a gander, and then they started running around like they're chick, like you know, chickens with their head cut off, scared. And um, Rod mentioned in the beginning, Hebrews three says that they weren't able to enter in because of unbelief. You know, so um, and if when we continue the story, you're gonna see that after he tells them that they have to wander um it didn't take them a long time to get there but when they got there then they had to turn around and wander the wilderness meaning like they had to just walk back forth up down like it was not any specific location because the 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 goal was to come right back to the same spot so they had to wander for that long and um you know so he could have done it but he, they were at a point where they oh this is a very good very good question, Sister June. Um, because they they were at a point where they they were mature enough to exercise a certain type of faith that Yah was requiring. In Egypt, they were getting to know Him, and that's what He said: "I'm going to do this so that way you'll know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim." Right. So by the time they got to the wilderness, uh, that He finished giving them manna, He finished taking them to the mount, He finished all these things. Right. So he was requiring a certain type of response because he understood that they knew better at this point. So because of their actions, they, you know, he didn't, he wasn't going to just do the same thing he did when they completely didn't have any idea who he was. But now that their faith that, that he proved himself, now they had to show their belief. So they, they were at a certain maturity level where he had to test their maturity and they chose to go against what they knew, um, what they saw Yah do, what they, what they, you know, all the miracles that they saw all the way up to this point was supposed to prove that Yah is with them. And only a few stuck to that faith, you know, and he, he so he had to, just like us, every level, he's not going to treat us the same way we were when we just came in. You know, obviously we're all here because we got to a certain level and we had to exercise that faith in Shabbat observance, Torah observance, feast observance, all the commandments that we started to learn while we were not keeping the commandments. He says, okay, now that you understand this, now keep this command now exercise your faith if we were to break these commands now we will be at a higher condemnation as if then when if we would have broke it before we knew you know uh we were not under condemnation while in ignorance but now that we know it's time to repent so the people were at a certain know-how and they um completely rejected it you know so um that's why they weren't just driven out but the, when they came back into the land they were driven out 
according to the faith of, of the tribes. Because each tribe had to demonstrate that faith for their own for their own inheritance. But yeah. Praise God, praise God. Yeah, no, that's <clears throat> definitely um part of the journey was for them to show their faith. Um, the warfare shows up um, as a way to exercise their faith. Um, and it's interesting you talked about the wandering because the actual Kadesh Barnea, Barnea means son of wandering. You know, they're in the land of wandering. <laughs> so uh, just amazing all the way around the way Yah structures um, his word for our understanding you know, in the meanings of the names, um, so on and so forth. All right, this concludes um, our study today. Um, uh, Numbers chapter 13, so we'll, we'll go into what happens uh, next week um, after they see what's in the land. Um, so read ahead and uh, We'll discuss chapter 14 next week. Praise Yah and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Toda Robah, praise Abba Yah from whom all Baraka flow. We hope this video encouraged you today. Don't forget to study to show yourself approved and be like the Bereans who tested everything. According to 2 Timothy 3.15 and Acts 17.11, we assemble every Shabbat and during the week with like-minded believers all over the world, virtually, and sometimes we gather in person for feast days. We have something for the whole family, including children. Discover more on our website at assemblyofyahuwah.com, where you can apply to join, give the biblical assembly needs, and find many biblical resources to help you grow in your walk with Yah. To know when we publish new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Jeremiah 33 3 tells us, Call to Yahuwah and He will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Much alone.